Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm delighted to introduce you to my guest today, Carolina Galvani. Now, for 10 years until 2016, Carolina worked as an investigative journalist for some of the world's most influential NGOs and environmental organizations, including World Animal Protection, Compassion in World Farming, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and Greenpeace. She carried out research and produced campaigns, documentaries, and reports in over 20 European, Asian, and Latin American countries. And many of her investigations were published by leading international media outlets, including the New York Times, the BBC, The Guardian, and Le Monde. Three years ago, Carolina founded Synergia Animal in Brazil, an international animal protection organization working to end the worst practices of animal agriculture, particularly in countries of the South, including Southeast Asia and Latin America. Welcome to the show, Carolina. Thank you so much, Katrina. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for, for the invitation. Oh, wonderful. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very excited to have you on the show because I think your journey has been just so interesting. Because obviously I've got a background in journalism as well, but mine is very different to yours. And I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit about how you came to do the kind of work that you did, because I believe you've got a degree in economics and then you've got a, a master's in international journalism. So I'm curious, like, was this the career you envisaged or how did it kind of happen or, you know, how did you make it happen or how did it kind of come about? Yeah, so basically it started, uh, I'll, I'll tell you from the very beginning, when I was 11 years old, I, I was reading a newspaper in Brazil and I read a story about um, a poor boy who lived in a, in a cartoon box in the streets of Sao Paulo, and that touched me very deeply at the time. And when I was 11 already, I decided I wanted to be a journalist, to basically tell the world, you know, about all the the injustices we face and maybe try to create something better. Uh, when I decided to go to university, I had two options, uh, uh, doing economics or journalism. And at the time I had a teacher in high school and she told me that if I first became an economist, I would understand the world much better to tell stories than if I just studied journalism. And that's why I decided to be an economist first. But having said that, I have always worked as a journalist. I never really worked with um, economics. And the way I got involved um, with animal protection, when I, was, when I was doing my master's degree in London, I, I was very involved with um, environmental and human rights issues. Uh, and when I, was, when I was about to finish the degree, I saw an opportunity to do some volunteer work with, with an investigative agency called EcoStorm based in London. Uh, they were looking for someone to go to Portugal and to, to be an interpreter to help them um, you know, uh, produce a documentary about factory farming. And that was basically, you know, I was already a vegetarian for health reasons, but I didn't know anything about animal agriculture. And I saw it all. Uh, it was in 2006, late 2006. So we, we were able to document uh, pig farms, cattle farms, egg farms, and um, slaughterhouses as well. And that was life changing, of course. I never imagined that um, animals suffered so much in food production. And after that, basically, I started doing a lot of assignments with them, um, many related to environmental issues and social issues, but most of them related to, to animals. So, yeah, I think, yeah, it, there was no way to, you know, to, to change things after that, right? I think when you, when you get, when you witness, like, so closely the reality of, of factory farms and slaughterhouses, um, it's difficult to, to move away from it and not to do anything about it. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing that. And I'm, I, I, it's almost like it kind of, it just sometimes when you kind of, I think what I'm hearing is 
you when you follow something that you're interested in or you're passionate about and you remain open then opportunities can come like you said with the agency you know open up and and it it, it worked out but so i'm curious how did you get those stories as i say you've worked for a lot of ngos how did you get those stories into the media like did you have to pitch them or did the ngos use their own press departments to get your work out there because it's an interesting one because i know that obviously you know i know from my own experience with mainstream media it can it's been hard it can still be hard to get them to really tell those kind of stories they might you know you know run stories about the latest vegan cupcake or even you know the rise of plant-based meat but to actually get them to tell the stories of the like you say the immense animal suffering can be quite tricky because they've got advertisers you know in, in animal ag so can you just tell us a little bit of how, how you got your work into such um, high profile organized uh, media outlets yeah most of the times uh, we had the the communications departments of these these NGOs you know pitching the, the stories to the media and I think there are some key factors of success. First of all, like they, they have very good relationships with journalists who are very interested in environmental or animal protection issues. So they know the media quite well uh, in their countries. And I also think one, two other things that might help um, animal protection organizations get coverage, get mainstream media coverage, is when we don't work with very strong images. Like when you have very strong images, it's, it's extremely hard to get the media to cover it because they know it's going to be shocking and not many people will be willing to watch uh, the footage or see the pictures. Uh, and another thing that I think it usually helps a lot um, to, to get media coverage is not only, it, it's really about the story you tell. So when you have like only a story about animal suffering, it might be hard to get media coverage. But if you have something that is related to a big company or to the government or to an international organization or institution, you, you have a better chance because you have like a, a, a political or economical story, story something, something to go with, uh, um, with the topic of animal suffering. That usually makes it more interesting, I would say. And a lot of my work was also related to deforestation in South America. And I think that's much, much easier uh, to attract media attention than um, yeah, animal agriculture issues, I would say. Oh, interesting. Ah. Interesting. Those are some really good tips, actually, really helpful. Um, and I think that's important as well, helpful for anyone who is perhaps looking to go into journalism, whether you're graduating from uni or even looking to do it later in life, because, you know, you and I have both seen that the media landscape change so much, so many journalists being made redundant or leaving and going into to other work. But I think we, your journey is a really interesting one in that you can use your skills that you've, um, you know, got whilst working as a journalist to partner with an NGO, for example, in order to get the stories into the media. So I think that's a really, uh, really good thing to point out to people that, you know, think a little bit creatively in terms of your career path. So thank you for sharing that. So can you tell us a little bit, I guess, without going into, I guess, too much kind of brutal detail, but I'm curious about some of the kinds of uh, investigations that you've done um, and any that you, you know, you can share any kind of anecdotes that perhaps were, you know, investigations that were particularly challenging or even dangerous. Yeah, I, th I think the, um, the hardest one for me was an investigation uh, we carried out in Belgium. Um, I visited 11 halal slaughterhouses in less than two weeks. And I saw um, um, cows, sheep, and goats being being slaughtered without stunning, and many other violations, like animals really watching the others being killed in front of them while they were waiting to 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 be slaughtered. And that that was very yeah that was surely the the hardest one and and the saddest one as well. But having said that, I think it's it's one of the investigations that um that was most 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 successful. Um, it took a lot of time when we released it, and I think it was in two thousand and ten or two thousand and eleven. 
the vice prime minister in Belgium declared that she wanted to make pre-stunning mandatory in the country. She wouldn't allow halal slaughter without prior stunning to happen anymore. Uh, and at the time it didn't really happen. But I, I know that in 2018, seven years later, uh, Belgium banned um, halal slaughter without stunning um, nationwide. So I think it, it surely, you know, it was a difficult one and one that um, I got kind of uh, traumatized, I would say. Um, it, it took me some months to recover, but it, the results were great. So I, I, I'm, I'm very, um, this is a very special one for me. Um, the most dangerous one, the investigation itself was not so dangerous, uh, but uh, yeah, the, the trip was, was very challenging. So I was sent to China to, to do an investigation about deforestation. Uh, and it was the time that I felt, you know, like, yeah, the, the most uh, challenging time for me because I had to enter and leave the country with undercover equipment. And I remember myself, you know, waiting at the airport and just thinking if something happens here, I think it's going to be very hard for anyone to help me or for myself to get out, you know, it's, it's going to be, if they Google my name, um, there are going to be, you know, many stories related to human rights and environmental issues. So yes, that, that was a very big challenge emotionally. Wow. So yeah. were, you, were you sent by someone to do that or did you, were you doing that off your own back? Did you have other people with you like camera people or other um, media or journalists or was it yeah yeah saying? we we had one person from Hong Kong flying to mainland China as well and there was one NGO uh, behind uh, the work sponsoring the work yeah but you were still basically mm -hmm. taking the risk yourself there wouldn't as you say there wouldn't be a lot that they could have done if you'd have been caught yeah, and <laughs> an individual. Yeah. wow wow gosh that's amazing any other anecdotes? Oh, no, this is really so interesting. Any other anecdotes you can share that, you know, are a bit kind of hairy and, or anything off the top of your head? Yeah, there is a funny one as well. It was one of my first ones. I was sent to Greece to, to investigate if the Greek uh, fur shops were selling seal fur. It was before Europe banned the, the sale of seal fur from, from Canada. Uh, so basically, I had to visit many fur shops, and I, at the time, the undercover equipment was quite big, and I had it like behind my back here on a on a big belt. So it was a big thing. If if you touched me, you would feel it. <laughs> like visiting many fur shops, asking them if, like what what types of fur do you sell? You know, do you have seal fur? Um, I found one at the very end, but it was very hard. But anyway, in one shop. They insisted that I should try this fur coat. Oh no, you have to try it. It's very beautiful. Okay, let's try it. And when I when I did try it, one of them came, and it it you know it it touched my back to to you know to to tie the belt. It had a belt. And when she, this woman touched me, she was like, "What is this?" Because it was hot and it was very big. And I was like. I couldn't say anything. I think I was quiet for like, I don't know, five seconds. And she was like, oh, it's just a belt, isn't it? She was like, yes, it's just a belt. <laughs> and then after they, they told me like, you know, we have this guy here and he knows all the fur shops and he can take you to all of them until you find the right coat for you. And I was like, okay, I, I didn't know how to say no because I didn't know if they were suspicious or not. And I was just thinking, you know, let's, okay, I'll, I'll walk around with this guy, but I will find a way, you know, to get rid of him. And then it was like all the time I was thinking, you know, is he following me because they know what I'm doing or he's just really, you know, he's just trying to get a tip, you know, a commission if, if I buy a fur coat. So it was like the whole afternoon walking around with this guy. And then after some time, I realized it was only about money and it was fine. Um, 
But yeah, it was a funny one. Oh was, gosh, oh. <laughs> this is stressful as well. <laughs> I remember doing some anti-fur protests as well, and I, I didn't go undercover officially like you, but I did kind of, um, yeah, kind of go in and speak to them, pretend to be a customer, and it's quite hard because you know you just want to kind of take the things off the rack and say you know stop murdering animals <laughs> thank you for sharing that you've obviously had such a you know fascinating career obviously quite stressful some of it but like you said when you have some some you know interesting outcomes then that can be good talk us through a little bit the, about the emotional side of this I know you've touched on it already when you said you know you went to the slaughterhouses and you know you really kind of saw up close that you know just awful you know the worst aspects of animal cruelty and even when you're you know watching footage or even just reading about things you know compiling your reports you're really immersed in that so how do you how did you and also obviously in, in your work now as CEO of uh, Synergia how do you handle that side of things um, so that you don't get burnt out either emotionally or physically? Yeah, so uh, when I started working with investigations, I was very young and I always felt, uh, you know, when you, when you do get the chance to document something and, and to show it, you know, to, to, to many people, I think that pays off. I didn't feel stressed most of the times because I knew the outcomes were very important and that kept me going for a long time. And it, I didn't feel the need to take care of my emotions or anything like that. When I started, I was 26, uh, so I was very, very young. Uh, when I was about, I think, 30, 35, 11 years later, uh, I went to my first meditation retreat and there I found out that I had many wounds that have, you know, that had never been treated. So I remember like two days of my meditation retreat, I was basically crying and feeling all the pain for everything I witnessed in, 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 the, in the previous years. So it was all kept inside, but I didn't deal with it for, for many years. Do you think you can part mentalize? <laughs> Sorry, what happened there? Do you think, you know, like you can compartmentalize your emotion in order to get up every day and do, do you think you did that and kind of put it away inside and then, as you say, it came out in the meditation? Yes, I think so. I think it was kept inside, um, kind of hidden. Uh, and I think the meditation really, you know, brought everything up and it brought a lot of, of healing as well. I think I, I became much more resilient and, and stronger because I remember that at this time and, and in, in many different occasions, uh, after doing this investigation in Belgium, for example, I remember telling the team, guys, I can do anything, anything you want me to do, I'm able to do it, but please don't send me back to slaughterhouses because that, that was too much to take. And I didn't want to go to factory farms as well. And I just, you know, I thought, you know, I'm going to change my career. I'm going to work more with environmental issues. So I was not dealing with the issue, but it was hurting me. And I was not aware of it. And I think after this meditation retreat, and currently I, I attend one or two long um, silent medit meditation retreats per year, I think it, it brought me a lot of, of resilience. I think we need a lot of resilience to do this type of work, you know, to be able to cope with pain, not to hide it, you know, just let it come, you know, let it go um, and bring back the sense that, you know, it has a very important meaning and, and some people have to do it. And I think meditation brought it back, I would say. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Because I'm surprised you didn't get sort of like nightmares. Do you know what I mean? Like doing it for that long, you know, with seeing all of that, like when you go to sleep, it's like, does it all kind of, come back then but I guess some people are better at like you say you know kind of compartmentalizing or focusing on the outcomes but eventually um like you say you have to do something to to deal with it so thank you for sharing that um and yeah I think meditation can be super helpful I think was it Vipassana that's the silent meditation um yes yeah yes. yeah you sure go to Vipassana retreats Wonderful, wonderful. Now, in recently, um, you took part in the VegFest UK um, Summer Fest online um, as part of the Vegan Women's Leadership Network. We had a panel on how to find your voice as a female leader in the animal advocacy and vegan movements. And I know you touched on it um, during the panel discussion. I'd love you to expand on it about 
you know, particularly working where you are, it, it, there's the sort of culture of masculinity, patriarchal, can be quite difficult for a woman to be heard. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and how you have managed to get your voice heard? Yeah, I think I was I was very lucky uh, with with my family. So I grew up in a family. Uh, my mom is a very strong woman, and she was. I I, I don't I. I think I never saw my mom as being, you know, less than my dad and the way she behaved in society was very powerful, very brave, very courageous. And I think she she taught me that from a very, you know, young age. And I was also the only uh, girl and I had two brothers and I was the one in the middle, the middle one. So I had to fight for everything, you know, from, from since I was very um, young. And I had, you know, my, my mom's support all the time, you know, like, you, you're not different, you don't have to do different thing, the tasks are not different, um, you know, you have to study, go to university, you have to, you know, build your own life, uh, be independent, so I think she, 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 she was able to really, you know, um, yeah, raise me with, with these very strong values. And I always felt very comfortable around men because I had two brothers, you know, I was the, the only um, girl um, in the family. Uh, but having said that, I grew up in a, in a very small town in Brazil. It's a cowboy town, uh, you know, a lot of farmers. So it is very sexist. Uh, and yeah, I think I experienced many challenges, especially when I was a teenager. Um, but again, I think I had a good family and that helped a lot. And when I started working with investigations, uh, I did work with a lot of men. It's, it's mostly, well, not so much. We had many women as well, but a lot of men. Um, they were good men. I don't think they were bad. Um, so it was very empowering as well. But I think I would say that the the, the key factor of success uh, is the fact that I, I always felt very comfortable around men and that was not, um, you know, my values were very clear when it comes to that. I don't know if it answers the question. Yeah, sure. I mean, you, you mentioned uh, when you were a teenager, you had some experience. Was that just kind of people harassing you? And how did you deal with that at such a young age? Because obviously this is something that's rife across the globe, um, you know, particularly for young women, um, you know, who can be kind of bullied, harassed, not only in person, but also online now. So I'm curious kind of how you handled that as a, a young person. Um... I think I was always very brave and I was, I always felt very confident to, to talk uh, with, with my friends and with my family about it. And I was always able to confront the situation if there was something that was not fair. I always felt very confident to do so. so yeah, that's, that's my answer. Yeah, cool. Okay. A lot of courage. I think, I, I think my family, you know, um, brought me up with a lot of courage. Right, so important to find support systems, hope if it's your family if possible, or if not, to find support system at, um, outside of that, I guess, as well, yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Now, obviously, so you've worked, as we mentioned, for some of the, the biggest, you know, leading NGOs in the world. And obviously, you know, with NGOs, the, there's a fundraising issue, everybody's kind of competing for, for funds and, and so on. I'm curious, why did you decide to start your own NGO? <laughs> yeah, so I, um, well, I came back to Brazil in 2013 and I worked for Humane Society International for three years. And after that, I was working for a Brazilian NGO called Forum Animal. And there were many things happening in Brazil. We, we had secured uh, many animal welfare commitments from the largest food companies. Veganism was growing quite a lot in Brazil. And I was talking to a friend in the movement and we just thought, you know, there is so much being done in Brazil, like the big international NGOs are already here. There is funding, there is capacity, but nothing similar is being done in other Latin American countries. 
And then the idea came that we would do similar work in other Latin American countries. And that's where, you know, that's, the, that's how Synergia Animal was born. It was born with the idea uh, to, to, to promote animal protection and veganism in countries, in neglected countries in Latin America where no other animal protection NGOs were operating. Um, I was able to talk to some donors. We, we started very, very small. In the first year, we had a team of, you know, something between two and four people. Uh, when we had four, uh, three of them were part-time. So, yeah, we started very small, uh, very, in a very pragmatic way, and we were able to achieve some good results. Um, one year after, we were... Uh, rated by animal charity evaluators as one of the most effective um, NGOs in the world. So it was a big surprise. So yeah, wow. big dream, lots of hard work, uh, and very, very not a lot of funding in the beginning. Very, very little. So I guess one of my questions was going to be, what were some of the challenges of doing that? Because, uh, you know, as starting up anything, you know, as, as a founder is, is quite challenging, whether it's a business, but obviously, you know, potentially even more so being an NGO. So aside from the funding, what other um, challenges were involved in, in starting up the, the NGO? Yeah, I think the first year was very, very challenging in terms of, of finding local talents. Uh, we didn't know anyone in these countries. We didn't have funds to go there and meet people face to face. We just did like online interviews and because the movement was so small, like we, we didn't really find people who had been working in similar roles previously. So we had a lot of problems with, um, yeah, with finding talents. And really, and another challenge was to really build a team that, you know, like is very young. We didn't know each other and we didn't have funds to go and meet each other as well. So. I remember Diamela, who is the one who is with us from, from the very beginning. I got to meet her one year later. We worked together for one full year. Uh, yeah, and we met, you know, in person um, one year later. So I think, um, especially when I think about her, you know, there was a lot of like um, loyalty and trust that was not easy to find in, in all the other countries or the other teams. Yeah. So that was a major challenge. Got it. Now you mentioned, so tell, tell us about the, the best things that have come out. You've mentioned that you already were recognized as, as you know, a, a leading effective NGO in the world after just a year. Um, can you tell us about maybe one or two of the things that you've achieved that have actually had an outcome? So I think that's quite important. You know, I think sometimes with, you know, NGOs, you do so much work and so much work and often people don't necessarily see the actual tangible outcomes. Yeah, so for me personally, the, the, the most beautiful thing was actually to meet new people. So currently we work in six different countries and it has been an amazing experience to meet, you know, the very first animal rights activists in countries such as Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Indonesia and Thailand. So I feel um, very honored and very happy that we had the chance to of course, there were other NGOs working in these countries, but we were we played a big role in uh, starting, especially the movement that fights for animal welfare reforms. Um, I think we are uh, the leading ones in these areas. In this area, uh, and I, yeah, and, and meeting this these activists who were like working for free, volunteering, doing a lot of things before we met and we hired them. It's yeah, it's very beautiful for me, very touching. Uh, in terms of achievements, I think we, the way we work, uh, we usually work with programs or campaigns that can deliver very measurable results. So for example, we work with animal welfare reforms and we use negotiations and campaigns to convince major food companies to phase out battery cages, for example, that's one, one key part of our work. And that's very, very clear, right? You, you can either, like, you can even estimate the number of animals that you will be taking out of cages. Uh, 
Um, another program that we can see like very clear results are our, our vegan challenges. So for example, every month in, in all these countries, we have two to 3,000 new people trying a vegan diet for 21 days. So we know something is gonna happen. So I think that's, that's a key factor of success as well. Like we always choose things that you know, can deliver results that are clear that's very important for our teams because if we don't see progress, it's very hard to keep ourselves motivated. But it's also very important to talk to donors. When you talk to donors and you have like clear outcomes, it's much easier, you know, to keep doing good work and, and keep um, having enough funds to, yeah, to operate. Brilliant. I love that. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you a few questions that I ask everyone. They're kind of just kind of almost like kind of little rapid fire um, questions. So tell us one thing that most people don't know about you. <laughs> so it could be an anecdote. It could be, and I'm sure you've probably got quite a few given your uh, career or somebody you've met or just something that the, you know, most people just wouldn't know about you. Maybe a little bit surprising. Yeah, I think, I think most people find me very calm and very gentle, but very deep inside, I'm very agitated. And I often tell my team that I'm, I'm mostly moved by anger. <laughs> so I'm actually very angry and um, yeah, I really have to, to control uh, my anger and my very agitated mind. So I think that's something that people... Um, don't don't see or don't expect when when they get to know me well i think that's an interesting one. i really appreciate you sharing that because i think you know because obviously you know when we see what's going on in the world you know to animals to people on the planet of course the natural reaction is oh my gosh you know it is one of anger but but what, but i think what you're doing is great in that you know you're doing your meditation and outwardly you're not showing that because if you're con as we know you know if you're kind of ranting and raving and, and just angry it can be quite difficult to create change. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. <laughs> um, what does leadership mean to you and what style of leader would you say you are? Yeah, I think leadership is mostly about um, empowering people uh, and allowing them to see how powerful they are and, you know, like to really see their true potential. I think if you are a good leader, that should be your top priority uh, in terms of working with individuals. Um, in terms of leadership, when it comes to, to managing an organization, especially in the type of work we do, I think it's very, very important to to, to help people see the importance of keeping focused and keeping um, a very pragmatic view. I think we are taking baby steps here, especially in the countries where we work in. So I think I try to work a lot with focus uh, and pragmatism because it's, it's, it's hard to get started. And if, if we don't do that, I think we are going to burn out before um, we see um, a lot of change. Mm, yeah, that's a very good point. What do you love most about yourself? Uh, I think the fact that I'm, I'm, I'm very, my courage, I think I'm very brave. Um, and I often get people, you know, to, to ask, like asking me, you know, how do you cope? How do you cope with so much stress, with so much responsibility? And actually, when I think, you know, for me, a lot of the times, it's just natural. I think it comes from, from the, the years of working with investigations as well, right? You take so much, so much risks that you, you kind of become used to, yeah, doing challenging things all the time. So I think my courage is, is what I admire the most. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I love what you said about the courage, because when you look back at your career, like, you know, like sometimes people have a fear of, you know, doing something new, doing something different, but our life isn't really in danger. It's just, you know, our, it's, it's the way we're wired. But like you have literally been in situations where your life potentially has been in danger. You know, you could have been imprisoned or, or what have you. So um, I love that you've got that perspective. Um, I think that's really great to share to develop 
yeah, to help people develop her own courage. And then just finally, I know you've probably touched on this a little bit, but anything else you'd like to add? What have been a couple of maybe key lessons that you've learned, um, you know, either about yourself or life in general that you would like to share with other vegan women leaders? Yeah, I think one um, key lesson for me, I don't think I would be able to be a leader now and, and to be working in so many different countries and challenging countries as well if I hadn't developed a lot of um, self-care um, and self-awareness. I think these are two things that are uh, very important because they are the things that will bring you courage, uh, resilience and uh, persistence as well. And also it will help you manage criticism because you, you do get criticized a lot when you expose yourself in a leadership position and you have to be able to first take it and, and really like, okay, maybe I have to improve here and they're right. Or to say, you know, no one is perfect. I take it, I accept it, but I, you know, there is, I cannot find a better solution. So we'll keep doing things as they are now. So I think this, yeah, self-awareness and emotional balance are crucial for these things. How have you done that, um, Caroline? I know you mentioned meditation. Have you done any other um, like personal development type work? Because I think what you're saying is so true because particularly when you say the criticism, you know, or any kind of rejection, that can literally stop people in their tracks from either pursuing a business or doing their activism um, because, you know, that, that thing of, you know, being criticized, uh, it, you know, it can really kind of, yeah, damage people and, and stop them. So I'm curious, what have you done to really develop that self-awareness and development? Yeah, I think, I think meditation was the most important tool. Um, another tool that I, I like very much is uh, nonviolent communication. Uh, nonviolent non communication is really about um, understanding your needs and your feelings very deeply and taking that into consideration when you, you know, when you interact with others. It's a very deep exercise. So I think these two are my favorite ones. Um, and one thing that comes with, with meditation is the ability of not taking yourself too seriously. Like you, 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 you learn how to laugh about yourself. You, know, you don't have to be perfect. Uh, you don't have to be liked for, by, by everybody. You, know, um, you just take things as they are and you're able to even you know, um, have some fun when you, when you face challenges. So I think, yeah. Yeah, those are some really good points, because I think I read in a, an interview that you did, you, you cop a lot of criticism, not only obviously from some of the company like the animal agriculture that you're, you know, trying to reform and change, but also I believe from some vegans or animal rights activists who don't necessarily agree with the animal welfare reforms. Just to wrap up, can you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think especially in the countries where we work, there is a lot of controversy because the animal rights movement is very young. So we we have um, yeah we have um, people who are often called abolitionists who really criticize our work to either reduce animal suffering or to work with campaigns that reduce but do not eliminate consumption, like this this pragmatic campaigns. Uh, so there is a lot of it in the countries where we work, and I think um, I think it's getting better, and everybody is understanding that all strategies are important, and we need diversity. You know, like we need people to do different things and to try different things because we we kind of think we know how the future is going to look like and how people are going to behave depending on what we tell them, but no one really knows. So we need to try and we need diversity for that. So it's getting better. It has been a school and I think we are, it's easier and easier. It's becoming easier and easier to, to deal uh, with this type of criticism um, in different countries. With the industry, yes, there is a lot of conflict. I have been sued twice wow. <laughs> in two different wow. organizations. Uh, luckily, the, we won in, in, in these two occasions. 
uh, yeah, and especially when we work in countries where we are the first ones to really come and challenge the industry with public awareness campaigns. We have very people, but like very angry people um, in meetings and they, yeah, they, they can really, uh, they cannot accept the fact that we can challenge them publicly like this. So there is a lot of conflict. But this part I quite enjoy, I have to say. It's, it's not a problem for me. Um, what is the third thing? Did you, did you ask about a third stakeholder? Uh, no, it was mainly just, I think, the industry and just, yeah, the vegan and animal rights um, communities because we can see, and I think particularly now with, you know, the, this year has been obviously incredibly challenging and I think we're really kind of seeing, or I'm certainly seeing online, people very divided, you know, whether it's politics or, you know, in vegan community and all social justice movements. I've seen it happen over the years. I'm sure you have too. But uh, I love what you said about just developing that resilience and just not letting it stop you in your tracks. And also, I really love what you said. I'd like to underscore what you said about not worrying about being liked, because if you are going to put yourself out there as a leader or an influencer of any kind, you're never going to please everyone and even people perhaps that you you know maybe you're quite friendly with or you know perhaps they look up to you or they respect you but then you might have an opinion on something and you know or you say something and they might not agree with it but not to hold yourself back um you know as long as obviously you know it's for the greater good and you're not being you know racist or sexist I don't mean that but um yeah I think it's it, I really like what you said about just kind of just letting that flow away and not you know, constantly questioning yourself like, oh, if I put that out publicly, will that person not like me anymore? And it can just take up so much time and energy that could be better spent doing, you know, as you say, some of the practical things that you've been doing. So where can we find um, Synergia online, um, Carolina, if we want to find out? Yes, more? our international website is www.synergiaanimalinternational.org. Um, so, yeah. Synergia, I'm going to spell it, it's S-I-N-E-R-G-I-A. So Synergia Animal International dot org. Great. Um, and we'll put links to that in the show notes yeah. page and on that Thank site you. so people can check out. So yeah, do check out um, the website. I think you're doing some amazing work. I love that you found a niche in what, <clears throat> in what you're doing. You know, you didn't just, <clears throat> excuse me, start up an NGO, you know, just for the sake of it, you, you literally pinpointed places where, you know, this kind of work isn't really being done to the extent that, you know, it needs to be. So um, thank you so much for sharing your incredible journey, Carolina, and the wonderful work thank you're you. doing. It's been great speaking with you.